we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I am Ashley Webb. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions with the Historical Society. Um, and I'm really, really excited about tonight's event because it's going to be very, um, very, very important to um, this building, of course, and what we've been doing um, the past 20 years. Um, just before we do get started, I have a couple of announcements. Um, the first is our upcoming fundraiser um, and our annual event, uh, History is Served. That is on October 12th at Hotel Roanoke. Um, tickets are on sale now if you are interested. Sumter are pretty. This is the third is going to be our speaker. And he's going to be talking about um, early Southern decorative arts, uh, mainly in this, this area and west and a little bit farther south. Um, so it should be a really, really great uh, lecture on material culture. Um, tickets are $100 per person or twelve or $1,250 per table for, of 10. And with that sponsor table, you do get ballet tickets for everyone in your party. Um, so again, that's October 12th. You can give us a call uh, if you do want to purchase tickets. We're really looking forward to that event. The other thing I did want to mention is um, I, while we are in Trackside Gallery, gallery uh, we do have Nancy Stark. She is a local artist, and um, we have all of her lovely works out uh, for you to see. She uh, is going to be having, hopefully, this is still tentative, um, a closing reception on November 4th. Um, so that's still to be determined, but um, we'd love to have you come back out. There is going to be a raffle of one of her 6x6 six six paintings, so if you have not put your name into the, the little fishbowl, make sure you do that to be um, entered to win for the raffle at the end of the exhibit. Um, again, November 4th, closing reception for that. Um, but other than that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, Dr. Sears is the former president of Center in the Square, where he led the organization for nearly 30 years. He is a doctorate from the University of Virginia in higher education administration and has spent his career helping to create a vibrant cultural center in downtown Roanoke. Chris Venable is an architect and principal in Spectrum Design, PC. He graduated from Virginia Tech in 1988, where he received his Bachelor of Architecture. Chris has over 30 years of experience in the design of public buildings, educational facilities, and the renovation of historic structures. He grew up in Roanoke, mostly. Um, he also worked in Richmond, Virginia and Raleigh, North Carolina before returning to Roanoke in 2006. David Bandy is the former president and director of, design, of, of Spectrum Design. He graduated in 1973 from Virginia Tech with a Bachelor of Architecture. David practiced architecture for over 45 years, working for several firms in the Roanoke Valley. He was employed by SFCS for almost 20 years where he served as an owner, lead designer, director of design, and principal. He was the founding principal of Spectrum Design in the year 2000, where he oversaw the design efforts at the firm until his retirement in 2019. He is an award-winning designer whose projects have been recognized by the American Institute of Architects at local, state, and national level. So I'm now going to turn it over to Chris, who is going to be talking about the history of this building. I want to know what mostly run up means is I grew up a Navy brat and when my dad had seen duty, we always came back to run up. So we were in California, we were in Rhode Island, we were in Virginia Beach, we were in Rhode That's where our grandparents were. So Rhode gets home and uh, this project is going to get to advance. Actually, <laughs> I have to wake up the motor for me. We worked a little while ago. Batteries, you didn't press the uh, arrow ahead button. <laughs> what button? <laughs> arrow forward. That's fine. You gotta show me what it is. <laughs> <laughs> arrow, arrow back one, please. One more. So I put animations on one more. Right, so uh, the project you see now, the building you see now, was a historic preservation uh, restoration project. Special Design was the architect, and the design team is here. As Mr. David Bandy was the lead designer. We had the project manager, uh, uh, the mechanical electrical team, all was there. We did have a full studio opening landscape. 
exhibits that you see, uh, the Lowe exhibit and the uh, Link exhibits, was by 1717 Studio out of uh, Richmond. Who was the contractor and the owner uh, was Center in the Square. Jim Sears was our main contact as president of Center, and uh, also Tom Brock as board member had a key role in the project. So I joined Spectrum in 2006. So this predated me because it was completed 2003, 2004, 2005. But I was the project manager for the Center Square big renovations. So when they needed something, I kept coming over here. I kept going back to those old drawings. I was fascinated by the uh, Raymond Lowy 1948 drawings. So with that, I decided I want to learn a little bit more about the long history. So we're going to look at 1880s. So what did run up look like in the 1880s? Well, that's when Run-Up was founded, and that's when the very first station was built. And that's the first station. It's really just down the track between here and Jefferson Street. So this is where the newly formed NW you connected up with the Shandor Railroad and the uh, uh, Richmond and Allegheny Railroad, and this was I'm not holding close enough, thank you. Okay. This, is, this is where really the railroad came together. Uh, so Big Lick was a settlement, it was uh, incorporated, and uh, while you know, Salt Lake had a great history, it wasn't a great name for a city with aspirations, so it was, uh, it was named Runnick after the river. They were first offered to name it Kimball for the president of the NW, and he said name it Runnick. So that was uh, approved by the General Assembly in uh, 1882. So there's a map from 1886 that shows the location and you can see the, the rectangles within the big rectangle were the passenger building and the baggage building and then the big train shed was a larger footprint there uh, so it was uh, the architect was from philadelphia it was uh, pearson yeah that's all, all we have in the, in the uh, documents pearson was the architect he designed both hotel roanoke and the depot and the depot was something of a English country village train depot, you know, in the keeping with the big manor house up on the hill. So the trains loaded on, on both sides, you know, the tracks were on both sides, so it could load two trains at once, two different directions at once. That was a step ahead, you can say the Virginia, Virginian station could only be loading one train at a time. But uh, the, the downside is you have train tracks on both sides. Uh, the upper level you can see was office space, and then the, those baggage and passenger functions were all down at track level. So there was uh, a railroad express office, a baggage room, there was a ladies' waiting room. Uh, it was described as handsomely finished in oiled wood. So I think, you know, think English countryside, English tour is uh, very much the idea they were going for. Uh, a little bit of a fame thing. And, uh, April 14th of 1891, President Benjamin Harrison stopped at the station on his visit to Rome. I won't go too far. I didn't read this slide. So, with the station, you had to cross active tracks, you had to get around the train. Uh, the, it really had become uh, an unsafe condition, yes, especially with the increased congestion that had occurred. So it was determined they had outgrown the station. It was a time for a new one, which leads us to 1905, the second passenger station, which is the building we're in now. And it was expanded a bit in 1815. So Roanoke had tremendous growth at the time. In 1900, it was 21,000 residents. In 1910, it was 38,000. So it nearly doubled in 10 years. It was a boom town. Now you can see the market, this photograph is from 1904. The market looks like it does now in a lot of ways. Uh, the first market building to the one side was replaced with the one we see now about 20 years later. But the market was established. This is a photograph from 1933 on, on cattle market day, which was still occurring then. But in 1905, cows were a problem. Cows were kind of roaming free through Roanoke. And uh, the president, of N.W. Johnson insisted that the city council enact an ordinance to get cows off the streets. <laughs> uh, he is quoted as saying, quote, I am not going to build a $100,000 cow shed for the city of Rome. <laughs> so, cows were a problem. This, this shows uh, how the, uh, like the new station is developed right here on the north side of the tracks, really a gateway to Hotel Roanoke. Uh, the architect for this building was Fry and Chesterman, who were from Lynchburg. 
So it is described as um, having four columns of Indiana limestone. You see a classical pediment. This is very much a neoclassical building, uh, really more in the kind of French Beaux Arts style. But you know, it has, has this classical, it's symmetric, both sides bounce each other out. It has the Italian tile roof. Um, the general manager of NW was Mayer, and he described it in the paper this way. He said, the building will be constructed of brick with stone trimmings. The architecture is colonial in style. In the general type, we'll have the features that correspond with some of the buildings of the University of Virginia. A handsome portico, massive stone columns. Uh, the trimmings of the building will be stone and terracotta. He goes on to say the waiting room will be very handsome. A large room with finished hardwoods. Uh, the rooms in the building will be handsomely furnished. But that's really the, uh, his architectural adjective. But he goes on describing it. Anyway, you see it as a very you know, classically uh, inspired building. And this is what it looked like. So you can recognize the forms, but the, the style of it is very much that uh, you know, neoclassical looking like Greece and Rome with the pediments. Four columns, uh, two doors entering the building. The drawings show behind to the south. Uh, you're above the track, so you can come to two platforms go down two sets of stairs each, so you no longer have to cross track, so it was a lot safer that way. Uh, the photograph shows the same situation. The Railway Express office is down here at the Shando Avenue street level. It makes it easy to uh, get wagons in and out. Go get forward, please. So uh, the one on top is Petersburg, Virginia. The one below is Ironton, Ohio. These are very similar, also by NW. They are they're not identical buildings, but they definitely are kind of cut from the same cloth. Yes. So there's a drawing with that that shows the detail through it. And the windows are wrapped in terracotta. You get that uh, decorative arts on those windows. Even with the classical elements, it's not a, a more Georgian neoclassical. This, this is a, like 19th century French influence. But with that, you know, why would a, a railroad want to be a neoclassical building? This ties you to history. This ties you to a long tradition of building. And you know, the whole colonial revival of these classical styles is to have instant credibility with, with the history of the country history of democracy and those kind of bigger, bigger items. Okay, so it describes a balcony connecting to uh, Randolph Street. There, and Randolph Street uh, became part of the Williams Road alignment. Next. So, in 1915, the gangways were expanded, and you can see more coverage and a little more reach. Go to the next one. Good. And the trains blows a lot of activity there on the on the tracks, but you can look for trains, trains come and go. Next. That's a view from Jefferson Street North uh, and the, the grounds to Hotel Ronica right there. You know, definitely a lot of activity. I'm sure a lot of black smoke coming up. Next one. If you noticed uh, a couple years ago when Amtrak came back, you know, should the should it open to the Hotel Ronica side, should it open to downtown? That's, that's been an age-old uh, dilemma. And the way they solved it in 1915 is they built this arcade across the tracks and it came out on Salem Avenue. Next. So this photograph shows where it comes out and I see that that building there is where, uh, to the right of Billy's, where a woodcut uh, barbershop is. Next. So that's what it looks like now. And think a little more time, and that's where the arcade would have landed. You would have been like 22 feet into the top. But, so you could get to the train from downtown or the hotel side. What's next? So the station, as we as it was built, uh, was served about 35 years. Um, please. There are no photographs of the interior, so we really had this one drawing to go by. This drawing was done in 1941 by NW as the existing condition, as they started thinking about how they might improve the station. You see the wood wainscoting, the plaster columns coming down. The, the two doors between the columns would open to the two. Uh, arches at the four-columned 
heaven. And for a coffin ceiling, you notice that. We'll talk about that in a bit. All right, uh, as a film site, you notice the American Legion Auditorium there, the hotel. It really was that full block between um, you know, Randolph and Jefferson Street. So next. And when trains came through at Jefferson, you know, they, they usually stayed on this side. Uh, next one, please. There's a famous photo of Roosevelt visiting in 1934. And if you see that and you thought, well, why didn't he come to the station? Why is he down at Jefferson? Why did the train move two blocks past? <laughs> so does anyone have, a, have an idea? So Roosevelt, everyone knew he had suffered from polio, but when he was in politics, he did not show any weakness. So he had devised a grand illusion where he could hold himself up with his arms, get tremendous upper body strength uh, from his rehabilitation. And he could walk down a ramp with rails, supporting himself. And when he walked through a crowd, like to the car, he usually had his son or was a military officer who walked with him, and he would just hold on to them, and they held him up. You know. So the, the illusion was maintained. He walked to his car, they drove through town, waving the crowd, went to the, to the veterans hospital for his dedication. So 1941, uh, the building's been in place for 35 years. Like any building, it has wear and tear. And the W wants to uh, remodel it. So we showed that, uh, that existing one. You see the copper ceiling, you see the wainscoting. Next, please. So this is what they're proposing to do. Uh, they're leaving everything from the belt up. Plaster stays, the ceiling stay, all that was probably in good condition. I suspect all that wood, after 35 years of baggage and carts, it was probably beaten all to pieces. It also had a wooden floor. It was a brick structure, but the wood was, uh, floor was wood structure. So they're showing a new glazed tile from you know, three feet down from the waistcoat. If you, I checked the course thing, it's seven and a half inches high. So if anybody went to a high school built between 1920 and the late 60s, that was the glazed tile in your quarter. That was the new material of the 20th century. Next. And some details here. You see they're putting in the central heat, but they're putting in the lace tile, they're putting in a concrete and steel floor structure, and a terrazzo on top of it, and they are truncating these columns up to be on top of the wainscoting, but from about three feet up, nothing is really being changed. Next. Uh, they were going to expand, they were going to tear down the four-column portico, and there's now a six-column portico, and they were going to spread the doors out. So this did not get built. This was uh, this is from August of 1941. So you know, why didn't it get built? A day that will live in infamy, right? So this, this, this project never happened. So the next one, please. But this is the significant train station for the first half of the 20th century. And this is the one where, I get think, think of the World War II years, the, the soldiers and sailors who went to Norfolk or up, up to New York, wherever they may be going, they rode through here on these trains. And coal was going back and forth, and the coal was powering uh, uh, steel mills, making steel for ships, making steel for tanks, yeah, making steel to run, the, run their ships uh, in, the, in the two theaters. So, uh, NW had a big role throughout after those years. So normally we would say this is a historically significant building and restoring it to this would be an appropriate thing to do. Except, next, 1948, the war is over. NW wants to get back to the renovation plans and uh, they have an idea of what they want to do. So next please. One more time. So what happened between the wars? <laughs> uh, okay. In Europe, after World War I, historic styles went out of fashion quickly. And that's because these ties to history became, these are the ties that take us to war with Germany and England and France every 30 years. Tremendous destruction of life, material, money, culture, great cities were destroyed. Yet Europe had enough of things that reminded them of empire and tradition. And with that next one, we have the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe, 1929. And I put this in here because this is a whole new way of looking at a building. You see 
clean, unadorned forms, geometric forms. The ceilings are flat, the floor is flat. These walls have no decoration. They are just beautiful slabs, in this case Arabian onyx, that's like the nicest stone in the world, just put together. Simply put together, but it's an incredibly elegant space with the glass <coughs> and natural light and, and these forms. Next. So in comes Raymond Lowy. So Raymond Lowy was born in France in 1893. He is uh, kind of known as the father of industrial design. He's known as the man who streamlined America. So he was a captain in the French uh, army in World War I. He immigrated to America in uh, New York City in 1919. And he really began a career in industrial design. Next, please. Uh, in the 1930s, he began a relationship with the Pennsylvania Railroad, and he did these concept designs for these streamlined locomotives. So you know, what, is, what is streamlining? It is these smooth lines, these, these bullet shapes. It looks like something in motion. I would say out there, these trains are in motion even when they're sitting still. It looks fast. It looks modern. This is progress. This is technology making the future brighter. You know, this is all those things. It's not looking back to history. This is looking forward to a new world. Yes. So for the Pennsylvania Railroad, this is the S1 locomotive from 1939. So, so Lowy designed this one. He did not design the J-Class, the 611, but we know this influenced him. You know, this, is, this is the new look. This is a modern machine. Next. So he also worked for a lot of corporations. He did logos. You know, branding was not a thing in the 30s like it is now, but he was doing it early. He, uh, in, the, in the 60s, he did the, uh, the, the liberal, liberal readings, I was called, the, the, the paint scheme for Air Force One, and that's still the same design they used to today, the for the Kennedys. Uh, he designed the, actually the bus of this uh, scenic cruiser for, for Greyhound. You know, he, he redid you know, Coke, uh, dispensing machines and bottles. They had dispensing machines and bottles before, but he made them smooth, he made them round, he took away the square edges. Page. Next. In uh, 1961, he uh, designed the Avanti for student paper. So he is a very forward thinking designer and stylist. So, next. So, April of 1946, North Western writes to the Pennsylvania Railroad asking for an introduction to Raymond Lowy and really asking the permission to engage him. Pennsylvania is a big, big company. North Western is not that big. So they had to ask nicely. There's one. Within a week, Pennsylvania Railroad writes back. Here's the contact. We have no objection. You may talk to them. Next. Within about a week after that, the Lowy Corporation answers, the business manager answers, and uh, the, the discussion is now in place. Next. Uh, Alman Fordyce, working for the Lowy Company, this is a telegram asking for a passage to be arranged and he's going to come to Roanoke in June of 1946. Next. And then shortly after, uh, uh, Lowy Company is proposing that Almond Fordyce would be the architect assigned this project. I really love the station there. If you look at the top, there's an RL embossed in it. And, and this is an incredibly elegant little graphic. And uh, it's not ornate, it's not a lot of flourish, it's just Geometric. It's like, I would love to see those on silver cufflinks. You know, that's just beautiful, beautiful work. Right, next. So, this is, is the plan that was uh, built for the expansions. This concourse at the top is what was added in 1948. And really, everything inside the building was reworked. Next. The title block shows Almond Fordyce Architect in New York City. Raymond Lowy Associates. So, uh, in the 50s, I found statistics that uh, there was 150 designers and architects working for Lowy at that time. So he was doing a lot of things. Not particularly that many buildings. Most of it was products or graphics or those sort of things. But, but there, are, there were several buildings in it. So this is a fairly rare instance for us to have one here at home. So I'll do some color on it. So the blue is the original 1905 footprint. In 15, with all the work with those uh, gangways, they added the 
uh, the initial space behind us here, and which made the building no longer be symmetric. Uh, and then in 46, the new portico, and then the uh, the rear portion. But drawings are 48. Uh, <laughs> So there's a lot of dates. So the drawings are dated September of 48. It opened, it opened in 49. Next. So it's catching up. This is a, a section through the CBC coming up into the concourse is this escalator which brought people riding the road up, up in modern style and they came into the space with two stairs on the outside leading to the, uh, the train platforms. So really it kept the you know, people from crossing paths and made it flow a lot easier. But you know, the, the, the modern convenience of riding the escalator up was uh, something for 1949. I would all like to add that, is this working? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is an important um, drawing to look at because this was very influential in the uh, architecture that we did on the renovation. renovation. Yes. So here, here's our postcard view. So the, the, uh, the classical elements, the, you know, the, the uh, Pediment and portico is gone. The, the sloping tile roofs are still there, but they're really hidden. And what you see is this great horizontality. You see these uh, straight line columns. It's, it's so a colonnade is there, but it is no longer a uh, ornate one with classical elements. The terracotta surrounds are removed, and a simple stone surround is installed, and that's what we see now. And then these uh, aluminum windows, rather than wood double hung windows, are, are in their place. Next. Actually, this is the photograph from the postcard, though. The gentleman in the hats there are the exact same ones you just saw. So this is the way it looked shortly after it was completed. And as you go through it, you know, next. Uh, inside, there was a map of NW's service area. There's a, a ticket counter, which is where the new counter for the uh, visitor center is now. Uh, you see this tiling on the walls. You see these stone elements. Uh, with these simple stone surrounds. The conference ceiling is gone, so it's a really simple flat ceiling with the one element there being the, the dome. Next. Going back to the concourse, the terrazzo floor has compass rows on the left and NW's logo on the right. Uh, three steps up because they wanted to get a higher clearance. The old uh, gangways were about 18 feet clear. They wanted a couple more feet for the trains of the 1940s. Looking back the other way, you see the escalators down, you see that, uh, that big stone wall that you see now. That was the exterior wall of 1905 building, but now it's clad in this uh, stone. And that ceiling and stone and floor makes me think of, of me and the other international style designs. So natural light, clean the forms, kind of intersectional planes, but not much ornament at all. So we have drawings. So Raymond Lowy <coughs> signed off on it. I think uh, Raymond Lowy signing it is a lot like Walt Disney signing something. He had all these people working for him, yet he had oversight and creative control. It's like he couldn't make every movie, but he, he knew what was going out the door for him out the door. That seems to be the case for Lowy. He had all sorts of staff working for him, but he still maintained the uh, design oversight. Next. Chris, I'd like to add one thing. Uh, Lise van der Rohe designed Barcelona pavilion that Chris showed you. And he also coined the phase, architectural phase, less is more. That is an architectural phase from his family. And so I remember going through college and we came up with the idea less is more. <laughs> but it was really interesting to see that very beautiful, very ornate building really just stripped down. But, as Chris said, that was the sign of being progressive and forward thinking, and that was the style. But it's really interesting to look back at the history of that and, and see how all of that happened. And we've had many architects say, wow, that, they, they, he really took a beautiful building and made it rather plain. <laughs> but, but that's what it was. We'll flip this. So, interior elevation, you see the dome, you see the clock, you see the stone, the button. So you see the clock? Well, there's the clock, and that is a photograph taken by Winston Wink, 1955. Mm -hmm. Next, again. 
And they're the, they're, the, they're the trains. The trains represented the newest by NW and one of the oldest by NW. Those trains, I think, are still in those, those cases upstairs, but they were on the wall. And this photo by Link, uh, that is actually Winston Link posing as the tourist. <laughs> this is the elevation through the concourse and the elevation of that train board on the stone wall. Next. So looking down the concourse, you can see those windows with uh, the tracks, the doors that lead to the stairs out. These uh, uh, boards for information for the train riders. Next. Again. And there's uh, Buck Stewart calling the trains, photo by Link from 56. Looking down the same view. Next. And again. And there's that, that train board and the, the steps up to the, uh, the new concourse. Next. And that's a Winston Link's photo. If you recognize the hat and the shirt and the jacket, that's them also standing up there at the board. But that, that was a official photo for uh, the restoration of the project. Mm -hmm. Let's right, so next. Uh, this is a sheet of signage and details, and I thought it was, had some very interesting stuff on it. And the Pocahontas line was the Cincinnati to Norfolk, so in Roanoke, it's 424 miles to Cincinnati, 253 to Norfolk, and that was kind of the pride of the Norfolk and Western. Uh, with it, you do see a product of the 1940s. There are the signage for the waiting room white and the waiting room color. And the, there it is. Next. Uh, you see the detail, the uh, uh, stairs going down to the tracks. There's a photograph of what was built. And again. And again. And the signage across the front of the tree, North Western Railway. There's the signage as it was originally. Next. There's some detailed drawings that we thought were interesting. Uh, this is a uh, Electrical detail at the button. It was sent to Lowy for approval and some details from the dining room, which uh, there's the finished product. So, next. So, I was interested in who Fordyce was. So, after his uh, several years with Lowy, he was an architect in New York on his own right. Uh, next. Uh, this is from the National Register. This was a uh, Orton Taylor store in Chevy Chase that was. It's uh, Rainwood Corporation, the architects were Snape and Four Dice and Hamlet. So he continued with uh, Laurie at least through uh, 1959 for this building, but in the 60s he was doing uh, many things of his own. Next. Most notably the Alaska Pool and Ice Rink in Central Park, 1962. Next. And so, let's take us up to the end of the line for the passenger station, 1971. Next. So this is uh, my wife in the box, and her twin sister, and her mother in the sunglasses. And they rode the train from Memphis to Roanoke to visit the grandparents. And their, their work cousins came out to meet them. So here's our view from out front. This is the working train station in 1966. Next. So it, it continued uh, through 1971, and I know that is small print and low-light. The last Pocahontas train, number four, left Roanoke at 12.19 p.m. The number 759 engine was pulling the train from Roanoke to Norfolk to commemorate the end of Norfolk and Western passenger service. So the diesel had been running for 11, 12 years at this point. But the Cincinnati Roanoke was on a diesel, but the last run at Roanoke to Norfolk was under steam. And there's a steam uh, leaving, leaving town there at 12:19 uh, in the afternoon. Next, and that is the end of the line for passenger service in Roanoke. Next, so the concourse we think stayed in place until about 91, because the uh, Dominion Tower, Wells Fargo, is there. It was completed in 91. It looks <coughs> so. I'm not sure the exact date, but sometime in the early 90s, uh, the railroad used this building for offices. And they just kind of let it be. Hit again. And again. They saved the end wall. Hit it again. And reinstalled it where they cut the building off. So they really weren't thinking probably anything except that was a way to save some money, you know, take it down, put it back up. But that actually played positively for the historic preservation side of things. Next. So Let's jump to 1996, one more time. So, Roanoke Magazine, 1996. World-class building, who designed it? 
next to it. What if we had a world-class building right downtown that we could renovate and use to welcome people from all over the world? We do. So, Jim, I'll uh, give you the mic and I'll press the glass. Thank you, Chris. Um, how many people knew Mr. Lincoln? That met him in person? John? They too? Um, that's why we're here. If Center and Square had not become involved in this, we would not have bought the station and we wouldn't be having this uh, event tonight to, to talk about the station. Um, and how did that come about? Things in front of come about in strange ways. I was at the mayor's house um, in Christmas, and I forget what year it was, probably, what, 90? Yeah. And uh, Kent Christman, who used to be the executive director here, and um, David Helmer, some of you remember them, they came to me and said, would you like to have a Owen Stanley Museum? Well, I knew a tiny, tiny bit about Owen Stanley. I didn't know if we wanted an Owen Stanley Museum or not. So it was time to give us some study. I don't just turn things down. I like to explore things to see if there's an opportunity there. So I explored it, and I felt like there was a, an opportunity. But it wasn't to be a museum that Center would run. It was, that's not our mission. Our mission is to form buildings, hand those over to nonprofits, and let them run whatever they put in the building. So I wanted to get across that the center would not support the building, but we would we would help renovate it. So uh, we didn't know that that was the best idea in the world anyway. So uh, talking about Winston Link, and then all of a sudden they bounced this word off um, the 1218 and tender, not being a railroad guy, I didn't know what the 1218 was. But they said they'd like to have that too. And um, so we said, well, David Helmer said, we don't know where that train is. So we looked for several years to find, to find that train. But before that, we went up to see Western Link in White Plains, New York. And we took three proposals to him. We took one that involved the old Grand Building, that is now the Hancock Building. And it has apartments and people who are renting those apartments. We took the uh, History Museum space at Center the Square and, um, what was the other place? We took the um, a Transportation Museum. And I guess Center's position was sort of neutral. Should a, an O. Winston Link Museum be at the Transportation Museum or with the History Museum? in either Grand Building or at Center of the Square. So we took all three proposals to Winston. And it was a great trip. Ed Meyer, who was Winston's attorney, some of you may know Ed, very cordial, picked us up at the airport, we drove over to Winston's house, and a lot of stories were told. We learned about uh, Winston and his ex-wife, or soon to be ex-wife, wife, I guess. And we learned about the fights that were in the Winston's driveway and um, with Ed there he introduced us to Winston and Winston as you all know is quite a character so we socialized a little bit and then um, we said well Winston let's sit down and see what the center wants to propose to you so I had the briefcase with me old timey briefcase and um, pulled out some plans and spent about five minutes explaining these plans and I think we focused on the grand building because we owned that at the time. And in about five minutes, he said, uh, close your briefcase. I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. So there wasn't really much discussion from our part, our side at that time. He told us what he wanted. So what did he want? He wanted the passenger station restored. He wanted the 1218 and tender located here. And I said, Winston, we don't own the passenger station. It's been sold to a North Carolina firm. We don't know where the 1218 is. We think maybe it was picked up by G. 
Japan and melted down. But I said, I'll explore all those things for you and get back to you. So we did, and uh, it didn't take too long to find out that David Hellman knew more about the uh, shipyard, I mean, the uh, rail yard, than a lot of people. He found the 1218. It was in the paint shop. So he called one day and said, um, get a few people together, let's go take a car ride. So he came by, we got the mayor and several other people, uh, Kent Christman and, uh, and David, and probably a couple others, I don't remember who they were. And we rode down to the, uh, the uh, rail yard and drove around, and of course the guards were down there. And Winston said, we'll, we'll have, you know, David Allen said, we'll avoid them. So we did, and we came to this building. And when we walked, when we walked into the building, there was the 1218. Painted up, sparkling, looked like brand new. And um, <clears throat> so people got onto the locomotive, had their pictures taken, and got off. I saved the pictures. I put those pictures on my desk one night within a day or two of going to visit. The next day, those pictures were not there. And I haven't seen those pictures in all those years. They just disappeared. So a little bit of a mystery with that. But we uh, came back and thought about the 1218 and the, and the passenger station and wondered whether that was within center's mission. So we thought it was a good idea that it would draw people, that would improve the e economy of Roanoke, so we decided to go ahead and get involved. So we got involved and we had the, had the Spectrum Design get involved, a perfect architecture firm to do something like this. And um, pretty soon we've raised, with the History Museum's assistance, about $10 million. Before I left White Plains, I told Winston, I said, you're talking about a $10 million project. The center square doesn't have a dime. He said, you'll find it. <laughs> we, did. we did. So um, the largest challenge, of course, was trying to get the building back. The building had already been sold to a North Carolina firm. They were going to take just the top layer and open a restaurant. And of course, we're at the bottom layer of it now. So a lot of architectural work went into this to make the room for the Old West of Lincoln Museum. And uh, we had another uh, policy at that time not to start any new project unless we had a rental agreement for someone within that building that would cover the operating cost. Because I was sort of tired of telling our people that supported center that we had a new project that's going to cost them more money. So we did that with the Shandor Hotel and we had the first floor rented. We still have the first floor rented, so that project is not costing us a bit more money than it was before we had the before we had the building. So CDB, what used to be the CDB called the VBBR now, they had indicated in their board meetings that they would like to have their offices here. If the passenger, if the station ever opened up, they'd like to come in and set up offices. In the meantime, they became interested in the 81, 581 uh, intersection. And so we thought, well, that's going to be a hard sell. So we went back to the records three or four years before that, and we showed the CUB that they had indicated they wanted to be located in this building. So they, they stuck with that, and they're here now, and they pay at least enough rent to cover the operating cost. Um, so that was a challenge. And then, of course, trying to raise the money was a challenge. But the History Museum jumped in and raised the money along with the city of Ronos and some federal tax credits, state tax credits, ice tea monies, and so we were able to get the monies together to do this project. And um, those, were, those were the immediate problems that we had. And we got back to Winston, and we said, we have, we have the problem solved, so we're going to move ahead. I talked to Winston almost every day for about a year, maybe, and um, he always had an objection. And I thought, will we ever, will we ever finish this project? Because every time I talked to him, he had a new idea. And uh, as you all know, during the middle of this project, he died. And I was worried about that too, because uh, 
would, would the project continue with Weston out of the picture? His trust came in and said, let's continue the project. So three or four guys on the trust, and the trust um, supported the project. We continued. Now my question is, would we have been able to finish the project if he had lived? <laughs> the condition of the building uh, right there before 2000. Well, it was all here, but it was not in good condition at all. You can see you know, cracks. This is right out where we were having the reception before. Up front, those uh, stones were off the wall. The walls are cracked. Uh, all the, no, most of the tile was gone. Many places the tile was gone. And uh, the stone was still intact for the most part. Uh, the dome was there, but it had been hidden behind uh, drop ceilings for many, many years. As the uh, NW offices were removed, it was just really a, a mess was left behind. So you can see what was left of the dining room. Was, the structure was there, but uh, you know, all the materials were gone. Uh, under the carpet, you saw the, uh, the compass rows in the terrazzo, which was a, a, a good thing because that is easily repaired. And there's that, uh, you know, that glass wall facing south that had been relocated in the 90s. Uh, and the steps. And, uh, so that was all. The bones were here to write for uh, redo. Uh, but the bathrooms look bad. Here's some like glazed tile again, which you should never paint. And here's the reason why. <laughs> the, uh, back up just a second. The, the fixtures there were reused uh, with new fittings put in them, so we try to keep everything as original as possible. Uh, down this level, you see uh, that's one of the spectrum employees uh, wearing waders walking in the high voltage room. Uh, I'll not recommend that, but uh, it was a, this was a wet basement at the time. So you have to understand, when we first came over here, this is what we saw down here. Two to three feet of water. And of course, in the flood of 85, this was a really big mess. And um, so the whole idea of how to use the lower level was a big question mark, if, it, if we could even use it at all. So Spectrum came on board in 2000, first concept. Well, I would like to take a moment uh, as, as a past president of Spectrum Design and lead designer and recognize Jim Sears and Center Square for doing a very wonderful thing from our perspective. And that was hiring Spectrum Design to do this project. <laughs> I will tell you that my brother, who is a retiree from Norfolk Southern, he was the last person to walk out of this building as an employee. Uh, and his office was actually right underneath the dome. He was a clerk, not a big important job, but I used to come over here and visit him and think, what a mess you work in over here. So when we got the opportunity to do this building, uh, I had a, a little bit of a relationship with that. My grandfather worked uh, over here in the, in the uh, shops and uh, I'm not exactly sure what he did over there, but I knew he worked and retired uh, as an employee of Norfolk Southern. But for Jim Sears to hire us was a great opportunity. It led to many other things for Spectrum Design. We were able to do the latest renovation of Center and Square with Jim and uh, Tom Brock and some of those people. We also uh, were able to do other projects in Roanoke, we did the Roanoke Higher Education Center and the Amphitheater Project and quite a few other things. So, thank you, Jim. You did a great job. So, that's it. We, uh, I was not, I did not assign myself as the original designer for this project. We had another team of architects that were taking the lead in managing and designing the project. And so the, because of the condition of that basement, what we called it then, well, we decided that maybe the best thing to do to give the old Winston Lake Museum the proper position on the site was to actually build a new gallery. A gallery that, you know, designed from scratch was really designed for a museum and for the kinds of things you need to do for that. And so we, as you can see from this sketch, we did an extension out of the building in that direction toward the curve up here with three strong galleries 
and a lobby area and that sort of thing. And that's what you see here. Here's a, a three-dimensional concept of what that can look like. A lot of times when you do an, uh, an expansion of a historical building, you do not do architecture of the same style. You try to do something different to show so there's a distinct difference between the old architecture that you're uh, celebrating and the new architecture you're putting there to do the, the new things you need to do. So this was the concept for that. The back view was a little bit more uh, dramatic with the views back. Uh, we knew that the Tommen might be over there uh, across the tracks from that. So we were trying to do something that would uh, recognize and give emphasis to the Tottenham when he came. Now, this was a $3.8 million project architecturally. That was the construction budget out of the $10 million. So when we priced this, uh, we were over budget. And I don't, I don't remember how much, but it was enough to be a great concern. So um, I remember very distinctly having a meeting in our office, and it was suggested that maybe I would attend that meeting. So I, so I as director of design, perspective. So we had decided that I would take over the design of the project. And I went down to this meeting, and John Bradshaw, who is with us today, was very prominent in that meeting as Jim Sears and all, and there was, it was a pretty heated discussion about what's the concept, what are we going to do, and how are we going to solve this problem and get this project built for $3.8 million. Well, <clears throat> to be honest, I didn't know a lot about the project at the time, and really what was, quite what was going on. So I decided when I attended that meeting, I would kind of keep my mouth shut and just listen and try to learn a little something before I open my mouth and show complete ignorance. So it got a little bit more heated and Tom Brock said, well, Mr. Bandy has said over there and he has said nothing in this whole meeting and he's supposed to be solving this problem. <laughs> and to John Bradshaw's credit, he said, wait a minute. He said, I know Mr. Bandy. See, I worked for Hastings Madden and Madden for about three and a half years in my career. And I knew Mr. Bradshaw and many of those uh, gentlemen at HC. And I actually worked on, on the first renovation of Center of the Square as an underling. I was one of the ones on about the fifth row back there, crawling. <laughs> but anyway, um, Mr. Bradshaw says, well, I know Mr. Bandy. And I think he's sitting over there and just listening and learning. And I can assure you that when we come back, we'll have a solution. Do you remember that, John? <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> you did. <laughs> I remember it distinctly. So I was really kind of taken back that Mr. Bradshaw would stand up uh, for me in that manner. So what we did do is we had to go back and really think about what we did. So we had three and a half million, three and a half, $3.8 million, we had this building with an upper level and a basement that was flooded. So really the only thing we could do is to use the lower level, the <coughs> basement, and that's where the square footage met with what was needed for the old Winston Link Museum. So clearly we just had to design this lower level in a way that accommodated the museum and we had to so the big thing at hand was to sell this to the O. Winston Link family and I said well the first thing we've got to do is we've got to stop talking about the upper level and the basement we've got to talk about the upper level and the lower level and then as we came up with the concept the big deal was was how how do you get people from this upper level to the lower level. Well, there's two things you can do. You can have an elevator and you can have a stairwell. So the idea was we had to take that, that transition space, which was gonna be new construction, 
and we had to make it so it did not feel like we were going down to the basement. We had to make it feel like it was just one constant transition from the upper level down and then to the lower level. And so with that, my understanding of is that the initial introduction to that, to the Ogunston Link family, was you're going to be in the lower level, and they said we're not going to be in the basement. Is that correct? <laughs> so we had to do sketches and concepts to show them what this was going to be like to convince the family that they were not being stuck in the basement. So looking at the basement, you can see that we had a great ceiling height, but the problem was, as many of you know, in 1985, we had a 500-year flood. And that became the new guidelines for everything for flooding in downtown Rome. So the floor, which you saw previously, had a couple feet of water in it. We had to raise that floor about, what, 30 inches or so? Because we, to be above the floodplain of the 500-year flood. That was the requirements for Rome City. So our concern was is that we were starting to push up and our ceiling height was getting very tight. And we wanted to keep the ceiling height in the museum you know, as high as possible because of lighting and that sort of thing and just the feel of the space. So we really, I mean, we were really looking at trying to save everything we could to just get every inch of ceiling height that we could in the space. So working with 1717 Design Group in Richmond, who were an excellent design firm for displays and that sort of thing, we decided to break the galleries down into basically four galleries. And the one being, we captured the space, this whole space that we were in for the reception was outside. That was kind of like a, it wasn't a cantilever space, but it had columns, but it was all outside so we could capture that space as well. And that became, yeah, here it is, the long, the long gallery uh, that began to be the introduction to the Ogunston Lane lower level. We uh, tore off some old pieces back here in, the, in that far corner back there. This was where the, the new elevator was going to be, and this is where that transition would take place from the upper level to the lower level. Let's go to the next one. So, I mentioned earlier that I wanted you to look at some of the architectural forms that were created in the original passenger station. And I, I just really found it quite interesting how those stairwells went down and then those uh, covered areas toward the planes, I just thought were quite beautiful and quite elegant. So, when we were thinking about how to do a stair, you know, instead of just putting in a, an industrial stair that wraps around itself and goes down, I said, let's design a stair because we could do an open stair. Uh, let's design one and let's make the stair actually a gallery. And it will be a continuation of that upper level to the lower level. So here's the stair. So because of the length of the travel distance, by code, we were required to have a landing in that stair. So, you know, I thought, well, rather than just doing a landing and just keep on going, let's stop and take advantage of that landing and how can we do that? So, during the construction, of, you know, during the demolition of the project, I stood there and, you know, I, I looked up through there and you have the railroad, of course, and you have the, is it turntable? The turntable, I keep wanting to call it the round table, but the turntable, and that's where the engines would set and be turned. And I thought, well, that's really quite interesting. And um, so let's create a little balcony type space here where you can actually come and just sit and watch the trains go by or see the uh, round uh, turntable and enjoy that for, you know, for a few moments if you like to. So I designed this very contemporary, elegant type of uh, bump out in that staircase for that to happen. And then we were meeting with the uh, building officials uh, during the design process, and they said, well, we think you, we, we're going to require you to have an exit door on that end of the uh, hallway as well. 
And I thought, crap. <laughs> I just messed up everything. So, um, you know, when you're going through the College of Architecture, you remember sometimes things college professors say to you. And, what, and I re always remembered was, well, if you have a problem, why not just turn around and make a feature out of it? So we had to put a door there. And I said, well, let's line this door directly underneath this pop-out, right in the middle. And instead of just doing steps, because we had to have steps because the level of the floor was above the level of the ground. And I said, well, let's do a cow catcher. So the steps are designed like a cow catcher. And the railing systems, so this is one pretty nice, pretty expensive exit door. <laughs> and then we also took the door, and you'll see that the, the window in the door is a round window. So it was like that light in the engine coming at you, and here's the cow catcher. So this was my great joy and fun in designing the old Winston Lake Museum. It was right here. I will tell you, if you go back to the interior, yeah. Uh, my family went together and we sponsored the, the uh, rest restoration of the Norfolk Southern sign. And if you go back upstairs, you'll see just to the left of that sign, my grandfather, Walter Bandy's a retirement party in the shops building, a picture of him at his retirement party. So, so it, was, it was a very personal project for me as well. So as we go through this building, you know, we had, with the historical preservation, you're not designing buildings. You're trying to get them back to the, what they were and, and as accurately as you can. And so the, trying to find tiles with the correct colors where ones were missing was uh, a challenge, but we were able to pretty much do that. As far as the floors were concerned, they were terrazzo, which is a great floor system and they can take a lot of abuse and you polish them, you refine them and polish them, and they come back to life. So that's what we had here. Uh, we were able to find some of the original um, benches that were in the, in the train station before with, from the Raymond Lloyd designs, and we were able to bring those by. In the, in the uh, gift shop, we, uh, we did not put tile back, but we put metal siding, again, a little bit of reflection of the exterior of the building with colors that were similar to the tiles previous. Again, we, we had a $3.8 million project, and that's not a lot of money. So I think, really, we accomplished a great deal for it. Not, not much money. So the, uh, the train board was still in place and covered up by the offices, but it was uh, great to see that it was still there, and that became restored to as it was and also to reflect the uh, Winston Lake photograph. So, ribbon cutting in 2003. You see, you see uh, Dr. Sears, you see some uh, dignitaries, that looks like uh, Griffith, yeah. Southwest Virginia, and some others uh, here on opening day. So the project was complete in 2003. The Winston Lake Museum really opened uh, in the spring 2004. You can see it's really been here uh, for going on 20 years now. In 2005, the Lowy Gallery was added to that one space. And you see it, uh, it's, it's upstairs now if you want to look at it, learn a little bit about Raymond Lowy. It also shows the 1940s plan and the renovation plan. So you can see you know, some of those uh, 1940s features and what is the same and what may have changed. Every time I see a picture of Raymond Lowy, I think of the 1930s, 40 movies. Everybody's so well dressed, so articulate about everything. I told Jim earlier, I used to tell young people in our office, you know, if you go in front of a client and they're going to give you 10 million, 40 million, 100 million dollars to do a building, you ought to look like you know how to spend it. <laughs> and Raymond Lowe, it looked like he knew how to spend it. Spend it well. So uh, two years ago, the visitors uh, here needed additional space, and they were looking at that Raymond uh, Lowe gallery space. 
So we thought, well, we know they need space, but that is a, a little, little treasure we did not want to lose. So, so this is where Louis Gallery was. This is now office space and meeting room for uh, Visit Virginia's Blue Ridge. And we brought it out to the South Concourse. And as we put it there, we want to make sure we kept the lines of sight to the, uh, you know, the rear window, and most importantly, to the train board. We did not want to block that view, and that's, that's why those uh, displays are canted the way they are. Because we're trying to make sure anybody can put on a, a fedora, mm -hmm. set up their, their timer, and get their picture looking at the train board. Mm -hmm. So that kind of brings us to where we're coming up on uh, nearly 20 years. And we're hoping uh, this building will continue to serve as well as it has for a long, long time. That's it. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? And you always want to know about uh, train stations. Yep. Does anyone have this book? You still have that book? We do. They're out of stock, but we do have stock copies. I read this a long time ago, and I read it yesterday. It's quick. Yeah. So if, if you do have it. Out of print, sorry. It's not out of stock. It's out of print. Oh, but we do print? have copies, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot in here that gives you a feeling of. Oh, Winston Lake, the trains and his pictures. It's really worth reading, and it takes an hour and a half to go through it and study the pictures. That's excellent. Question? When we were in here setting up the Lake Museum originally, right after we got it approved and got it underway, one of the most fascinating details of this building, to me anyway, was the Dung Tunnel. And you haven't mentioned that tonight. <laughs> well, let's go back to that plane. Okay, here with me. Okay, it's more like track, track level, rather. <laughs> There's the tunnel. This, this whole wall here is stone, and it's a retaining wall, like a basin. And one of the problems that we had um, from an engineering perspective was water would seep through that wall. So obviously water seeping through a wall with a gallery right next to it with <laughs> photographs is a problem. <laughs> so we, we built another wall beyond that and so you can actually walk through here, and we designed a system to collect that water. We could not stop the water, but we could collect it and build another super wall behind it and take that water out of the building. Now, I think what the gentleman is referring to, and it was probably at this location, there was a tunnel back, as I understand it, to Hotel Roma. And uh, at that time, they did not have bathrooms and all in the, in the rooms so you would have a, a, I don't know what the correct word for those walls were, chamber but you pots. Would, chamber pots, and then they have to be carried out and taken. And they would be carried out and go through this tunnel and out to the Roanoke River. <laughs> so there's some history there. <laughs> there were many, many issues with this lower level engineering-wise and architectural that had to be solved to make it what you see today. I'd like to uh, recognize Allison Blanton in the back. Stand up for that because you were, you were key. You were key to this project. Allison understands what the owner is trying to do and she also understands what the offices in Richmond want, and you are an architectural historian? Yes. Yeah. And I worked with Allison on a number of our projects, and she will do everything she can to help you and still stay within the guidelines of the Richmond requirements. Thank you. Well, Talk, but before we do that, 
We do have a little um, thank you for, for you all for speaking. Um, so I'll just pass these off to you. It's nothing terribly fancy, but thank you all so much for, for being here tonight and uh, speaking. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. So she said that this is what happens. We do, yes. Yeah. So they are. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.